Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, Yankee Enterprise, Finances and Fine Art in Church's Heart of the Andes with Katherine Manthorne. My name is Carolyn Keough, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Olana Partnership. Before we get started, I want to give a special thanks to our members participating in tonight's webinar. Your continuous support helps make free programs like this webinar possible. In addition to supporting the Olana Partnership, members receive free discounts, discounts to programs and free access to special events like this weekend's special member preview of our new winter exhibit, Spectacle, Frederick Church and the Business of Art, which opens this Sunday on November 19th. You can become a member by visiting olana.org backslash membership. And to learn more about our new exciting exhibition, Stay tuned tonight during our webinar and visit olana.org slash spectacle. Before we dive in, I'd love to give a quick plug for a special winter solstice celebration that we're hosting on Saturday, December 16th. Join us at Olana State Historic Site for a celebration of winter around the world. During this free program, visit the main house and new exhibition, join indoor and outdoor musical performances by the multicultural jazz band Heard World, and warm up by a bonfire on Olana's East Lawn from 1 to 5 p.m. I hope to see you all there. Now, a few mo notes on Zoom before we get started. As an attendee, your sound and video will remain off throughout this webinar. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions of our speaker, and you're welcome to ask these questions throughout the webinar, but we won't be an answering them until the last 15 minutes of the program. You can move the speaker's image during the talk if it's covering her presentation by clicking the black bar above her picture and dragging it. If you're having any issues with your Zoom today, please contact me directly at education at olana.org. I will also be available for any troubleshooting if it happens in the chat function. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Catherine Manthorne, who will be helping us kick off our brand new exhibition with tonight's exciting presentation. Dr. Manthorne is an art historian at the Graduate Center committed to the study of the art of the Americas. Landscape imagery is a special passion embodied in publications like Tropical Renaissance, North American Artists Exploring Latin America, and Traveler Artists, Landscapes of Latin America from the Patricia Phelps de Cisneros Collection. Women's contributions to visual culture constitute another theme in her work, featured in two books, Women in the Dark, American Female Photographers, 1850 to 1900, and Restless Enterprise, The Art and Life of Eliza Pratt Greater X, which Dr. Manthorne gave a presentation for about just a few years ago. <laughs> uh, Dr. Manthorne received fellowships from Crystal Bridges, Museum of American Art, Fulbright, and the Smithsonian Institution. And Dr. Manthorne, we are just so thrilled to have you here tonight. I, I've said it to you privately and I'll say it to you here before you take it away. What a wonderful way to introduce this exhibition and to kick things off. Uh, take it away, we're excited to have you. Carolyn, thank you so much. This is like so exciting to be able to speak to everyone about this wonderful exhibition and the work of Frederick Church. So without further ado, I'll just jump in. And uh, you, as you heard my title, Yankee Enterprise, Finances and Fine Art in Churches Heart of the Andes. So this title uh, screen looks a little uh, maybe dis disruptive or doesn't really quite match, but I wanted to immediately set up this dialogue between uh, church's ability to create this amazing uh, five by 10 foot canvas uh, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the heart of the Andes. Uh, and that's represented here, of course, by his uh, paints and uh, brushes and painting equipment. So on the one hand, you have this amazing artist who uh, very, in this period of the 1850s, when he does this work, is already being recognized as one of the major artists uh, in the United States. And on the other hand, you have someone, as we'll be uh, thinking about tonight and, and talking about tonight, who has an, a, an incredible business acumen and is able to negotiate uh, contracts for his pictures that are quite um, amazing uh, and many other details of his, of his finances. So this is the kind of um, duality that uh, exists in this one person, and I'm showing this portrait on the left, uh, one of his early portraits, because I think it really sort of um, emphasizes his forehead and just his, uh, you know, the, his head for numbers and his ability to uh, think in um, both of these two terms, uh, the finances and the fine art. 
So the exhibition that's opening on Sunday, I hope everyone will get a chance to see it. I'm very excited because when you think about it, the heart of the Andes over the decades has received um, scholarship and interesting interpretations from a wide number of different scholars. And we've, you know, we've thought about it in terms of Humboldt, in terms of uh, Church's place in the Hudson River School, in the terms of Manifest Destiny, and many different uh, kinds of contexts in which we have discussed this. But uh, we haven't specifically looked at the financial aspects of it. And so I think that the, this exhibition spectacle will really be a wonderful opportunity um, to do that. And to think too about the fact that in the mid 19th century, Americans really didn't look at art just for aesthetic pleasure. Uh, it wasn't like we just kick back and look at this and say, wow, this is just so beautiful. We could say that, but uh, there was also the imperative to uh, teach a moral lesson and to impart knowledge of geography and natural history. And we know that uh, students, uh, school groups were actually brought to see this painting. And, um, you know, it was actually, it was called a geography lesson in paint. So there are so many different um, aspects to this picture and we'll just be unraveling one of them. We can't really talk about church without talking about Thomas Cole, who was his early teacher and an important mentor uh, for everything that Church um, did in, in the course of his career. And I'll say, I think to Church's credit, that he always acknowledged Cole as um, for the importance that he had in his career. I mean, sometimes students will later sort of deny the influence of the teacher, right? But um, in the case of, of Church, he always uh, spoke in, in almost reverential terms about Cole. Uh, we know that Cole, um, was uh, did accept church as a student and he worked uh, church work with Cole from about in 1844 to 1846 and uh, the the program was a little bit uh, flexible I guess you could say uh, but basically uh, in a, in one letter Cole outlines the fact that he would have um, uh, students church specifically working in a studio part of the time, but that the, this um, that he would also take him out sketching uh, in the summer months out in the landscape on his various uh, different expedition, uh, sketching expeditions. So we know Church had that firsthand experience of being with Cole and being out in the landscape and you know seeing through Cole's eyes at first uh, just how to negotiate that uh, na natural presence and how to sketch and draw and think about what uh, you could observe on the spot versus what would be useful to you later when you uh, did a, a full-scale painting. The other big influence that's always acknowledged with Church is, of course, Alexander von Humboldt. And there are many, many portraits of Humboldt, but I particularly love this one by uh, Edward End Edward Ender. Uh, you can see here's uh, Humboldt sitting in his uh, yellow uh, jacket here. And I think of this as the rock star painting because he's sort of leaning back. The spotlight is on him. Uh, he looks very relaxed, even though, of course, he's in um, Venezuela having quite a, a difficult time on the Orinoco River. He's completely surrounded by, you know, uh, specimens and boxes and somebody else would be going a little bit... Um, you know, be a little bit overwhelmed, but Humboldt seems to be in control of the whole thing. And of course, uh, there's Bonplant in the shadow, as he often was, uh, even though he was traveling alongside Humboldt and doing a lot of the work as well. Um, he never really got as much credit, nor did he write as much, of course, as Humboldt did. So this is the pair who are traveling in South America from 1799 to 1804, and then for the rest of uh, Humboldt's life until his death in 1859, he continues to write about, uh, ab about those experiences and to synthesize them into a broader uh, natural history. And we know that Church had some of these books and uh, definitely took his cues in terms of his uh, exploration of the Andes from Humboldt. So when he comes, when Church comes to paint uh, the heart of the Andes, uh, he's uh, quite uh, astute in the way he uh, negotiates his financial dealings. He works out a contract 
with uh, Blodgett to Blodgett agrees to purchase the painting for ten thousand dollars, which is already an enormous amount of money uh, in 1859. But Church has the further stipulation that if he could get twenty thousand dollars or more for it, that Blodgett would then give up the right to the paintings, all, which uh, Blodgett agreed to. Church also um, managed to negotiate the fact that it, the picture would actually be touring for two years. So here's Mr. Blodgett, and I'm showing on the left uh, Eastman Johnson's portrait of the Blodgett family at Christmas time. And you can see some other smaller paintings on the wall behind Blodgett. Uh, he was actually very well known for uh, his collection and especially for his good taste in European art. So Blodgett agrees to pay the $10,000, but yet doesn't even see his painting uh, for two years after, uh, after that agreement. So we have to ask ourselves, ourselves, what drove the artist's economics? I mean, this is pretty um, amazing stuff for somebody who um, is basically a painter. He's not, he wasn't trained as a businessman, right? And so what I've been thinking about, and this might see a little, seem a little off the wall, but bear with me. Um, I've been thinking about Benjamin Franklin uh, because uh, Benjamin Franklin's um, treatises uh, his, uh, he's known for his uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, but that was sort of absorbed into this other book, The Way to Wealth, that I'm showing here on the screen. And um, I think sometimes people don't realize it, but there were over a thousand editions of this book, The Way to Wealth, in 26 different languages that people have identified by 1850. So I'm not saying that Church sat down with this book or with his Poor Richard's Almanac and you know studied it. But these ideas were in the air. Um, Franklin's notions were, um, you know, almost common parlance, just like we uh, sometimes use expressions from Shakespeare without even knowing it. So, you know, the express expressions like early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's Franklin. But you could imagine the church, <laughs> his, um, his way of conducting his life was very much in, in sync with that. So this portrait by um, by Martin here of Franklin, you can see um, the bust of Sir Isaac Newton and um, Franklin sitting there with his papers and his glasses. And in fact, he was uh, one of the people who really fashioned uh, bifocals and that's what he's wearing. So he's practical, he's economically savvy. He's many, you know, he, he you can almost imagine that he would have been a guide for church and of course, uh, church's father. So here I'm just suggesting this trio of Thomas Cole, who's shaping Church's approach to landscape painting, Alexander von Humboldt, who is, of course, inspiring him on South America and natural history, but Benjamin Franklin, um, whose ideas on uh, practical matters and also this notion of personal improvement that we'll see was also something that Church uh, very much embraced. So I, I'd broken down the, um, the presentation into a few different parts that will sort of inform your um, engagement with the spectacle exhibition. So first, just to mention a few basics about Church's travels and his relation to Humboldt. So the map here, you can see the, this is Humboldt's um, travels that it, it is being indicated in these broken lines. But Church basically followed a similar route. Of course, he's not coming from Europe, but uh, so he's coming from New York. He goes, his first journey in 1853, he comes down to Cartagena uh, in present day Colombia, crosses overland all the way to uh, Guayaquil eventually, and then takes a boat back up across the Isthmus to the Isthmus of Panama, crosses it and back to New York. On a second trip, he's just going to Ecuador. So he uh, goes from uh, New York crosses the isthmus and uh, down to uh, to Ecuador. So he's investing an enormous amount of time and, um, you know, pre preparation and expense in order to um, have this experience. And he's basically searching for some of the different sites that Humboldt has visited. So on the right here, I'm showing you one of the images from Humboldt's uh, picturesque atlas. Um, that's uh, the Chimborazo, uh, which at the time was uh, Humboldt claim was the highest point on earth. Later, it was, um, that was debunked, but uh, certainly it's one of the highest ones. And this is the peak that Humboldt saw as, you know, the big challenge that he wanted to climb. So Church features it um, in individual pictures, but also the peak in the heart of the Andes um, on the left is thought to be 
uh, inspired by by Chimbrazo. So, I mean, when you start peeling back all the layers of Church's travels and the things that he did on in relation to this trip and the painting, you realize, if, if, for example, even his choice of traveling companions. Uh, here I'm showing you on the left is uh, Cyrus Field, his traveling companion in 1853. So. Field is the one who's famous for, you know, lay, laying the transatlantic cable. But at the time that he was um, traveling with Church, he the, the the sort of excuse of their trip was that his brother had disappeared somewhere in South America, and they were going to go find him. I mean, that seems to have been, um, you know, a kind of vague rationale. But uh, certainly, he made an excellent traveling companion, uh, well informed, and also um, a kind of savvy businessman himself. On the right, you can see, well, Church is in the middle, of course. And on the right, you can see uh, this is Louis Mignot, with whom tra Church traveled in 1857. Mignot was a painter uh, as well. And sometimes people make a comment that, you know, Church, um, that somehow Mignot w was the lesser painter. But I think that um, when you actually see some of Mignot's work, these are two that uh, came out of the tr that trip that they made together. You can see that Mignot, is quite versatile for one thing. Um, I had done an exhibition a while back um, at the North Carolina Museum about him. Uh, he was born in Charleston, South Carolina. And so, you know, comes with a very different uh, sort of heritage than church, you know, the, the New England um, Congregationalist, uh, Minio is Catholic. Um, and I only mention that because it, I think it definitely informed the way that they looked at South America and the uh, people they saw there. but. In other words, I'm trying to just say that Minya was no slouch. <laughs> I think Church wanted to travel with somebody who had somewhat different skills than he did. And I would argue, and I think I have argued somewhere, that um, after traveling with Minya, Church's color and sense of light does change a bit. And I think that the two of them uh, complement each other. And uh, that was a wise decision to travel with someone like Minya. So if we think again about um, just the way Church prepared for his trip, um, his study of not just Humboldt, but natural history, he also tried to, to study a little bit of Spanish. And here on the right, I'm showing you, this is a page from, uh, for a while in 1853, he tried to keep his diary in Spanish. Um, it's pretty much gringo Spanish, <laughs> but, um, but he gave it a whirl. And he also kept a vocabulary of all the different kinds of words. and like we all do, special foods that he that he wanted to be able to eat. But you can see that, um, again, another uh, maxim of, of Franklin's, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Church, you know, so was so wholeheartedly embracing of this kind of concept. He, you know, think about the library that now exists at Olana. He, um, you know, Franklin too says, um, even even when I had very little money, I always invested in books. And Church too, you know, thought of this idea of the library as being uh, foundational to his artistic practice. And um, the image on the left, the Cotopaxi, is an early one in the Smithsonian, um, which follows uh, again Humboldt's some of Humboldt, another of Humboldt's images. But the the little hacienda that he includes in the foreground was actually the place that Humboldt had stayed when he was traveling through there around 1800. Church gets a letter of introduction, goes to the same house, visits the same people, and has that experience of um, not just the experience, but you know, does the research to be able to to know about this and to and to seek this out. Uh, this image is another image of Cotopaxi. Cot that was one of his um, you know, pri primary motifs from South America. But I'm showing you this because, uh, again, I find it fascinating. Um, when Church was in Quito in 1853, he writes in his diary, I visited the, the, the studio of the most famous artist here, Senor Salas, S-A-L-A-S. And so we know that the Salas family was almost like the Peels, you know. There was the father and the and the sons and the and the um, and the cousins, and uh, they had originally been uh, colon painters of colonial religious art and portraits. And um, I like to think that Church's presence, as well as of course the influence of Humboldt, um, redirected some of the work that the family members did. And here on the right, you can see Rafael Salas's image of um, Chimborazo. 
But what's also interesting in the, about the painting on the left, which is in the Cisneros collection, is that um, Church apparently left it there. I mean, most uh, most of what he did, he he made sketches and drawings, and he brought them home in order to prepare, you know, works for the future. But this work, um, whether he gifted it to them or exchanged something, it's not entirely clear. But this remained with the Salas family, who uh, founded the Art Academy in Quito. So this uh, remained there until the uh, until the twentieth century. It was in the um, sort of could have been a teaching aid, I like to think, although I haven't found the evidence to support that entirely. But I, I mean, I know it was in, it was there. I just don't know exactly how it was used. And of course, I ca can't talk about code epoxy without showing the big uh, version from 1862, which is now in Detroit. But this was commissioned by James Lennox, who was the, um, the founder of the New York Public. So again, the idea of knowledge of um, and the, you can see that over time, Church's ideas about geology, his knowledge of geology, have expanded, and now th there's this great rift in the earth. They, you know, you have the sense that there was a eruption and an earthquake, and we can see these incredible stratifications uh, in the in the rock. And again, he's he's studying about this. He's reading it about it. Uh, well, to, in, again, tourists, you know, you go, you, you're traveling through the country. Uh, Church had a particular interest in textiles, it seems. Uh, there was a recent exhibition at Olana about the, some of the different um, costumes and, and outfits that he had purchased when he was in um, Jordan and um, in Jerusalem. And uh, when he was in Mexico, he also uh, acquired the rebosos. There was a very interesting lecture about that at Olana, which I guess um, we can check with Carolyn, but I'm pretty sure it's on um, available on YouTube. And here you can see he's already looking in 1853. He's always looking already looking at the Ruana or this um, cape that the um, the man is wearing here in Heart of the Andes. And he writes back to his mother in 1853. A fine Ruana requires six months work often, and yet the best seldom bring more than eight or ten dollars. So think about that. He's not writing, wow, mom, you know, I saw these great uh, garments that these men are wearing or, you know, anything of that sort. No, he's immediately thinking about labor expended versus the market value accrued in these um, in these garments. So I, I, to me, it just says that it just speaks volumes about uh, the kind of thinking that uh, is ingrained in Church's uh, approach. So creating Heart of the Andes, we talked a little bit about his travels. And of course, he makes many, many draw pencil drawings, as you can see here, oil sketches. Some of them are just the animals. I love the Yama here, uh, as well as more finished uh, landscapes. But we know from some of his associates, um, and especially William Stillman, he talked about the fact that Church had one of the most remarkable visual memories he had ever seen. Um, he said, you know, Church could look at something and, you know, two days later, draw, you know, draw some kind of exact um, dis description of it. So he has this wonderful visual memory, but he's also making, you know, we can imagine thinking to himself, okay, I'm only here for so long. I have to make these drawings. I'm not sure what kind of painting is going to come out of this, but I need to have, um, you know, get as much uh, recorded as I can. Um, so that's basically what he did when he went to create the, the heart of the Andes. And here you can see again, that motif of the Ruana and where the, um, the, the figures are located here in this painting. And so as we're uh, thinking about the finances of it, you know, kind of keep this image in mind, how it all came together to, to create this painting and to put it before a public. I mean, I think arguably with the tour that the painting went on, which we'll talk about, um, it's probably was seen by more people than almost any other American painting of this period. And uh, so it has a, a, you know, a resonance through the resonance through the ages. So these are, again, just two details uh, from the painting. And you can see, you know, how much uh, detailed, uh, laborious kind of minute work he would have been using a very fine brush to create some of this material, uh, you know, of the uh, of the vegetation, of the, you can see the butterfly, the the bird. And of course, I love this detail that I, where I put the arrow 
uh, that's signed, where he signed and dated his name in, in the tree. But uh, if you think about it, um, the, the whole idea of how much work this took, uh, you know, uh, when Church was working in his 10th Street studio, he that it was one of those places where uh, you know part of the idea of the studio was to be accessible to the public and uh people would wander in and out of uh the different artists stu studios but church um, was very um, much against that and even a columnist at the time wrote that mr church has li very little leisure to receive visitors and um he has to be free of unnecessary interruption so again, I'm just emphasizing this idea, the Franklin notion of speak little, do much. You know, in other words, Church uh, didn't see that as a good use of his time. So again, just uh, the touring of the Heart of the Andes. Uh, he finishes the work. He shows it at the 10th Street Studio building, and then he sends it on a multiple city tour uh, throughout the United different cities in the United States, and it also goes over to London. Um, sadly. Uh, he was he and his friend Bayer Taylor were cooking up uh, an idea to send it to Berlin so that as Church put it, um, I could put the um, the painting before Humboldt's eyes and he could see you know the things that he had seen in South America. But unfortunately, as I mentioned at the beginning, Humboldt died in 1859, just as this plan was being hatched, and so uh, the the Berlin stop on the tour was uh, was scratched. But these are the kinds of, of um, notices that would have been in the press, that would have been put on uh, signs in around the town, around the city. Church's painting is being exhibited in here is um, at the studio building. Uh, that was his, his famous, that famous building in um, that housed the artists early on. But you can see if in, the, in the smaller letters, it says from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then from 7 to 10. So it was, um, trying to show it at night by gaslight, um, which uh, was, you know, a big draw. Pe people were fascinated. Just think about a time when there wasn't uh, so much public entertainment as we have today. I mean, this was an amazing opportunity and uh, was the talk of the town. Uh, in the lower corner here, you can see this is a subscriber's card uh, when it went to the, to the New Bond Street in London. And you know, so you could pay 25 cents for each time you saw it, or you could get a subscriber's card or what we might call a season's pass um, to, in order to go multiple times. And we know that many people did go multiple times. So um, just to remind, remind people or to mention for those of you who aren't as um, wild uh, ch church fans, um, that prior to the heart of the Andes, uh, Church had painted Niagara in 1857, another large painting. And uh, this was the blockbuster of that year. And he had sent that on a multi-city tour. And so, you know, you can kind of think about it almost as a kind of dry run for Heart of the Andes, because he's already having the experience of, you know, ha getting agents, uh, making sure that notices are, are appearing in the press, um, it, just encountering all different kinds of um, you know, the, learning how to negotiate the challenges of that type of activity, right? So um, this is something that Church is um, learning as he goes. But he's writing his own playbook, too. I mean, I think it's so fascinating, the things that he includes, the things that he does. And uh, and again, as, Hank, as uh, Franklin says, drive thy business, let it not drive thee. So Church is, you know, he's kind of in the driver's seat, um, thinking about different things. Uh, strategies that he wants to use. And one of them, as I was saying, was um, the idea of, of showing it at night too. And I don't think there, as far as I can, I know or could remember, there's not, there has not really been um, a, an image of how this was exactly shown at night. But this is a, a different, this is a theater in London a, a little bit later. But you can see the gas lights uh, here along um, the bottom of the uh, stage and um, the, the, the backdrop here. But so you can imagine, you have to have the lights close enough that it sheds some illumination. But at the same time, of course, you don't want Heart of the Andes to go up in flames. So there, there is a um, a kind of uh, give and take where you could put these things. And people say that it's maybe was maybe worth about a fifteen watt light or something like that, but that it was very kind of yellowish. 
So people, uh, is the, one of the critics said that the painting suffered torture by gaslight. So I like that phrase. But I think nonetheless, people were interested and excited to, you know, it was a novelty, right? It was something that they didn't usually get to do or see. So as we were saying, you know, many, many people, um, thousands, we don't have an exact number of how many went to see the Heart of the Andes, but these are just two of the more famous people who left their, um, their impressions. And Mark Twain famously went to see it um, and wrote back to his brother, Orion, about his experiences. And so he writes, your third visit will find your brain gasping and straining what, with futile effort to take in all the wonder in. So he's he's already on his third visit. And then Fanny Kemble, the British actress, is writing uh, who is touring in America. She saw the painting in Boston. Uh, she writes back to Lord Layton, the artist Lord Layton. It seems to me as if you would never imagine or, or would consent to such gross charlatanry, which is practiced. So earlier in her passage, she's saying that she really was fascinated by the painting and, and, and is very enthusiastic about it. But at the same time, she uses the word gross charlatanry. And so, you know, there is this element of um, thinking that there's a bit of trickery or something going on. So again, this emphasizes church's um, negotiation between fine art and popular culture, between, you know, uh, catering to somebody like uh, Blodgett, who will buy the painting, and catering to the large numbers of people who are buy, lining up and paying 25 cents a piece to see the painting. Right. And uh, another one of his uh, strategies was that he um, create he designed this frame, which the Metropolitan Museum um, recreated. And here you're seeing here. So it was this idea of the window onto the Andean world. Right. So that's the sort of um, motif. And you can see that, you know, that idea that you're looking out and just enjoying all the different aspects of this scenery. Um, and But as you can see, another critic wrote, as an accessory to Mr. Church's picture, the frame is Barnum-esque. So he's comparing it to P.T. Barnum, right? And although objectionable, altogether objectionable, artifice does not fraternize with art. But that's exactly what Church was doing. He, he was taking some risks and uh, you know, trying to uh, negotiate this new um, kind of border between fine art and popular culture. And I think, you know, it, it paid off quite handsomely in his case. Uh, um, another uh, aspect of it was people were advised to bring their opera glasses. And if they didn't have them, there were some available uh, in this hall where Church uh, set up the painting. He would also, uh, when he first showed it in the studio building, he had um, palm fonts and uh, birds, you know, tropical birds chirping away and things like that. So people could really have this kind of immersive experience. And so on the one hand, you would take in the whole painting and, you know, get the full breadth of the Andes. But then when you put your opera glasses up to your eyes, you know, you would see something like this little portion, this little uh, segment here. So again, uh, Mark Twain writes, we took the opera glasses and examined its beauties minutely. For the naked eye cannot discern the little wayside flowers and soft shadows and patches of sunshine and half hidden bunches of grass and jets of water, which form some of the most enchanting features. So literally you're blocking out the room, you're blocking out everyone else, you're putting the glasses up to your face and you're having this kind of moment when you can almost feel that you're in tropical America. And that's just exactly what church was aiming for. Of course, he was not the only person to create the single picture exhibitions. Uh, his skill at painting and public uh, relations really uh, put him in a different category than some of the other artists. But I just wanted to remind you that um, on the left here, you're looking at Vert Muller's uh, Donna in the Shower of Gold from 1787. And there are wonderful passages in Charles Wilson Peale's writing about seeing this exhibition for pay and how they wanted to be sure that um, you know, that it was not um, too uh, too much exposed, it ha should have a private viewing. And uh, here you can see uh, Rembrandt Peel, his court of death, which he toured around for years. Uh, and so these are two examples. But I did want to emphasize, too, that we don't always think about church being uh, influenced by a woman artist, right? But uh, this is Rosa Bonner's horse fair. 
And um, she painted this in 1853. It was a big, huge sensation, traveled around for several years. Um, there were smaller painted versions of it. There were printed reproductions. So it's it's for several years um, prior to his doing the heart of uh, uh, sorry, doing Niagara. This he would have I'm sure he would have been aware of this. But then um, Rosa Bonheur's painting comes to a New York, and it's actually shown at Church's Gallery of William Stevens and Williams in 1857 into early 1858, just as Church's you know thinking about the heart of the Andes. So I like to think of Rosa Bonheur in the mix as well. And finally, just to wrap up the tour, um, here you can see. Uh, this is um, Weir, John Ferguson Weir, and he had was a, a teenager. He was 18 years old when the painting was at the studio uh, building, which you see in the lower right. And he talks about the fact that people were standing in line for hours. The line was going around all around these big blocks in New York City, and he referred to it as phenomenal in, as, in the history of single picture exhibitions. Um, so the the promotion of the heart of the andes also had um, a lot of interesting features there were a number of pamphlets uh several two in particular that I'll, we'll mention here uh, this one was written by louis le grand noble and who was the um the minister church, cole's minister and then church's friend and minister no was he his minister maybe not but anyway um noble travels with him uh to when he goes to see the icebergs and then on the upper right, I'm just showing you J.G. Brown, one of his newsboys, because um, Church also had agents who would place um, many, many notices in the newspapers ahead of um, the actual exhibition and then uh, ensure that there were unbiased reviews, positive, of course, uh, in the newspaper as well. And the other person who wrote the uh, one of the pamphlets is Theodore Winthrop, who was Church's close friend um, in, in this period. And here you can see on the left a portrait of uh, the photograph of Church seated and uh, Winthrop standing over him. But sadly, uh, Winthrop uh, signed up for the Union Army, and uh, he it's often mentioned that he was the first Union officer killed in the war in one of the very er early battles, the Battle of Bethel. Um, but so uh, anyway, that was a terrible tragedy. But Winthrop is a very interesting uh, character in, in relation to church because um, Winthrop went to Yale and studied at with Benjamin Silliman. And I don't know if that name is familiar to everybody, but Silliman was like Mr. Geology, right? He taught these geology courses at Yale. He uh, did state surveys. He uh, started this journal called the American Journal of Science and Art. Uh, he was really uh, another voice of um, natural history becoming more popular. And later, when I when I was going through the Th Theodore Winthrop papers, I found that uh, Winthrop actually writes to Silliman and says, "Oh, I was, you know, I'm your, one of your former pupils." And he goes on. But but my point here is that Winthrop knew geology. So when he's describing uh, Church's painting and talking about the different um, aspects of the mountains and the geological forces in South America, you know, he knows what he's talking about. So literally, these books. Yeah, see, these little pamphlets, I should say, well, you know, about 50, 40 or 50 pages, I think, um, he is taking the viewer by the hand and saying, okay, here's this feature. That's, this is what this means. Here's this feature. This is what that means. And uh, really, you know, ex the expositor for church, the voice of church uh, talking about the painting. Anyway, so um, that was another strategy. So Church hires John McClure to oversee the logistics and the and the tour of the painting. And again, Church has this um, draws up these contracts. So the contract required that half of the net profits of the tour would go to Church, and that McClure had to insure the painting for ten thousand dollars. And they also had this publicist named Richard Miller who places the ads and the quote unquote impartial reviews. And here you can see this is New Bond Street. That was the area where Church's show was um, appeared and this was the area where you know a lot of the galleries were lo already located so um, it's well situated and another uh, strategy they used was to make reproductions of it only one person of course would have the painting but um, many people could own engravings after it or reproductions after it so this is a work by William Forrest that you can see here this was not completed till 1862 
But when you went in to see the painting, see the Heart of the Indies, you can sign up and subscribe so that when this engraving was done, uh, you would get your copy and, of course, pay for it. Uh, and so there were, you know, Forrest saw the painting when it was in Britain, but then they also had um, this. This is a watercolor in the National Gallery, which um, it, it was probably one of the um, sources. It was carefully done, a reproduction of the Heart of the Indies from which uh, Forrest could have worked. And of course, this is just Humboldt's Chimborazo here and another painting that Church himself did of Chimborazo uh, that appears in the back of Heart of the Indies. And, you know, I just wanted to em emphasize again that some a lot of people, including Wittridge, um, thought of Church as kind of a, a pretty lucky guy, right? Uh, Wittridge writes that Church's, Church was for, Fortune's favorite from the beginning. But again, I'd refer you to Franklin who says, diligence is the mother of good luck. Church worked all the time. He was an extremely um, diligent and conscientious uh, person. And um, that was also partly due to his father. So here's the portrait of his father here on the left, Joseph Church. Um, Joseph Church's family uh, were in the paper making business, was in the paper making business, and he worked there with them for a bit. But then he actually moved to um, Hartford and worked and established his own business there, which was um, watchmaking, uh, jewelry, and uh, silver. And he was extremely um, successful and, and good businessman. Uh, David Huntington, one of the early scholars on church, calls him the Puritan businessman. I like that. And here I'm just showing you two of the, um, you know, the logos for his company his, with his partner, Rogers. Um, so uh, church's father then, um, moved on from just being um, a jeweler and, and um, you know, in a, his own specific business. And he became very involved in the um, growing insurance company, uh, insurance industry in, that was especially connected to Hartford where, where he was. And he was actually on the board of trustees, I think, for the Aetna company for something like 43 years. So Church himself, Frederick Church, becomes immersed or enmeshed, if you want to say, in the expanding insurance industry of his native Hartford. So, I mean, I've read many, many artists' letters and, and, and diaries, and I've never seen as much emphasis on insurance as, as Church um, insists upon. So, uh, as we said, he insisted on Hart being, um, Heart of the Andes being insured. But he writes in his letters, um, oh, I, I have this painting in my studio. I have insured it for such and such an amount of money. So when you buy it, you know, he's talking to one of his patrons, when you purchase it, um, I will transfer the insurance to you. So he's very careful about all this. So again, I'm just uh, comparing to Franklin because Franklin is really considered the kind of father of American insurance. Um, you know, he started the volunteer fire company, but then he saw all the damage that um, you know, the loss of property can do. And so he was actually founded the first insurance company in the United States. So, um, or in, in uh, well, even before that became the United States. So um, another parallel. And of course, we can't uh, tell the story of church and the heart of the Andes and the finances without uh, mentioning his mother um, and his wife. Uh, his he, he wrote constantly to his mother on his travels and, um, uh, again, his his marriage, his his home are all tied up with Heart of the Indies because um, it was when Isabel uh, Carnes came to, you know, traveled from her native Ohio to New York City to see the Heart of the Indies that she met Church and they got married in 1860. And then it's said that Church took the $10,000 from Blodgett and used it, you know, to buy the property uh, that became Olana. So it's all it's a wonderful kind of story altogether. Well, as Franklin also said, if you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. So Church, of course, I think con con consciously or subconsciously was very aware of what his reputation, you know, what he wanted his reputation to be and uh, worked hard for that. So here you can see the heart of the Andes. Again, we're um, maybe overdoing the seeing the heart of the Andes, but uh, this is uh, the way it was shown in the sanitary fair in 1864. And you can see that above the fr this window frame are the, the portraits of three presidents. So you have um, Adams, 
Washington and Jefferson. So, you know, it, it, of course, a not so subtle message putting South America uh, as part of, of this nationalist agenda and manifest destiny. And here is just a, one of the Bierstadt brothers of stereographs of the sanitary fair. And you can see I'm just pointing to the heart of the Andes with the painting with the uh, portraits above it. Lois is at the end. And if we could see the other wall, we would see that Bierstadt was over here. So it's the trio from uh, this now in the map. So Church goes on to uh, see, visit and paint many other places as well. Uh, of course, this is uh, the rock at El Cosne at Petra. And um, he goes to Mexico, he starts going to Mexico about 1880. And we know that, you know, he talks about the fact that he can no longer travel to South America, which he very much misses, but he sees uh, Mexico as kind of the next best thing. So he's he travels uh, in Mexico and, and doesn't seem to have made any large scale paintings, but still is, is still drawing, still sketching, still doing uh, oil, small oils. And the other uh, thing that's remarkable about and lasting about Church's legacy is his involvement with the Metropolitan Museum. He was um, a long-term, um, one of the founding trustees. And also on his travels in Mexico, especially, he acquired a number of different objects, including uh, what turns out to be these uh, Toltec reliefs. Um, this is one of two that uh, he gave to the Met. Um, and you can, the last time I was there anyway, they were still up. But um, what's also interesting is that when he wrote the letter which, to the Met giving these works, which are still in their files, he actually says he gives it in the hopes that it will establish a gallery of art of the Americas. So this is the way he, you know, he's thinking and very much a part of um, what becomes now the, um, the, the wonderful collections of art of the Americas at the Met. Well, we have to bring it home, right, to Olana. So uh, here you can see uh, the home that he purchased uh, in the wake of uh, and with some of the prophets of the heart of the Andes and this wonderful um, work that's going on at Olana. I hope if you haven't been there, uh, you will visit because uh, there's really an effort to sort of recreate a lot of what uh, Church had as his working farm in later years when he could no longer uh, paint as well. He uh, he turns his attention much more to um, the agricultural aspect of it. So this is no you know country villa. This is a working farm, and here you can see this is um, his gardener. This is the um, so-called kitchen garden, and then his studio. And this might seem a bit jarring or um, maybe a little bit offbeat. But I couldn't help thinking about somebody like uh, Church in relation to Andy Warhol, because Warhol, too, um, his, you know, he doesn't call it a studio. He works in a factory, right? He calls a studio his factory. And he's working in multimedia, and he's trying to aim uh, for a very popular audience. So um, I thought I would just end on this note of the, uh, the, these two bookends of American art, uh, Frederick Church and Andy Warhol. Thank you for your attention. Kathy, thank you so much. I, I love that you ended with um, Andy Warhol. We, you know, we have a few questions coming in, but I had a question of my own, which I think kind of ties to that a little bit. Um, you know, I whenever I hear about some of the tropical plants and the birds that he brought in and some of the ways that he adorned his display of Heart of the Andes, you know, I'm struck by the ways in which he's so ahead of his time and really kind of creating this immersive installation. You know, I can't help but bring my mind to, you know, immersive in installations and exhibition politics and some of that, the politics of display that we see in the most modern and contemporary art museums today. Um, so I guess I have a question that kind of ties to some of the questions that have been coming in through the Q&A, which is, was he, um, was he kind of the first or a pioneering person bringing in some of these objects and some of these um, experiential pieces of ephemera from his travels into the display of this single picture exhibition? To what extent was that unique? Um, well, so I think Ch Church was certainly in the in the lead. You know, he was one of the early people to do it. But you think of somebody like Bierstadt, um, who was also, um, you know, sort of they weren't quite neck and neck. I mean, Church uh, Church is showing Heart of the Andes in '59. He had shown Niagara in '57, 
And Bierstadt doesn't really get totally cooking until uh, about 62, 63, really. I mean, he he just goes out to the foothills of the Rockies in 59 as Church's Heart of the Andes is traveling around. But uh, Bierstadt, too, um, you know, for example, at the sanitary fair, he, he Bierstadt uh, sets up um, a, you know, a display with objects that he had collected in the American West, and um, and had, and so there is a, a sort of material culture and the context setting a context. But the other people, you, we can't forget other people. Like um, I was almost brought in Catlin, um, but I decided, you know, I, I thought it was all getting too much. But someone like George Catlin, um, you know, he shows his Indian gallery, and so he he he's really, you know, a lot of the American artists were just so. Um, clever in the way they conducted themselves. Um, Catlin actually made these special frames so that when he traveled the paintings around, um, one could fit inside the other. You know, so he made these little like um, spiky things that were on the four corners and then whole, you know, little uh, uh, indentations on the other side so that he could pack them all much more carefully so he wouldn't have to use all the bubble wrap <laughs> that we use. But uh, he, he was um, exhibiting all these paintings. Then he would have like a teepee um set up and um uh, actually he had shows he you know we to and this is not I, this is not a good thing but he had brought native native americans with him when he had the show in london and also in in uh, paris so he ha has native people actually performing um this is you know in the late 1830s so you know there, there were different strategies that that artists um would use to um, you know, to gain attention for their work, and and especially, I think the artist explorers, those people that went to these you know kind of far flung places and saw these things that other people hadn't seen, were eager to like create some kind of context because how could the people really understand what the heck they were showing them just in the painting, right? They had to have um, like some aids in order to really grasp it. And Catlin too, you know, he wrote he wrote books. He's he's doing the shows. He's doing his paintings. So you know there there were a lot of strategies that that were out there. But I think um, Catlin, you know, never was financially successful. So Church um, seemed to be also. He, it's kind of a matter of timing too. Perhaps you know. I'm sure. Mm. Yeah, I think with, with that in mind, we had a question come in um, from Christine Oaklander, kind of thinking a little bit about Thomas Cole's touring, um, history of touring. You know, he <laughs> toured Voyage of Life extensively, and perhaps this was an influence. Um, he had tallies of the number of visitors and the money that had taken in. Um, so perhaps that was part of the influence for Church. Um, so that I don't know if you have thoughts on that and thoughts on, on, on Cole's. I think sometimes we all often think of timing in terms of church's success versus Cole's as well. Oh, yeah. Well, the, I mean, you know, that's why I started out the first artist. I, the first thing I really mentioned was Cole, you know, the church's painting to the memory of Cole, uh, because church was, um, you know, totally um, in, uh, absorbing all of all of the lessons that Cole had to teach him, including the financial ones. But, um, you know, so so there's absolutely th those things are in play as well. Um, but uh, Cole, you know, again, Cole's success wasn't, um, you know, wasn't really the kind of thing that um, of the same caliber or the same quality. I don't think that churches, was. I mean, he just never made that as much money. And uh, so, you know, that was why I brought in some of the other influences as well. But, but certainly I think Cole and also uh, Church's father, um, you know, I didn't really show the letter, some of Church's letters to his father, but he talks about, he talks about his art as business. He's my business, mm -hmm. you know as you mm -hmm. probably know. Yeah. So, so you know, it's there's no one thing, right? I mean, church is like a sponge, um, or we're all like sponges. I mean, we're absorbing different influences and different so it's not it's not as if we're um saying this this was an influence and this wasn't. I mean, he's kind of uh, taking the things from many different sources and and combining them to um write his own uh playbook. Yeah. With that in mind, what a great, um, te you're teeing me up, Kathy. I really appreciate it. Uh, Patrick <laughs> asked a question. We had some questions coming through about the painting, and one of which was from Patrick asking if Heart of the Andes is a composite I image. So thinking about church kind of bringing in and bringing a lot of influences together, to what extent um, is Heart of the Andes a composite? Is it a collage of different scenes? Excellent. Yeah, we should. Um, I didn't really 
yeah, so uh, especially Theodore Winthrop explains this in his in his uh, pamphlet. He talks about the fact he, he absolutely uses that word, the what, composite, and he says that uh, you know the church is combining um, things that he's seen in different places. So you know the best waterfall that he saw in one place, and the best view of of Chimborazo from another, and the people by the roadside shrine. You know m all of these things. I, I have no doubt that he observed, but they wouldn't have been in one place. We, there's no, we could, he never stood in one place and saw exactly what he see, what you see in Heart of the Andes. And, you know, so all artists are taking liberties and all, and, um, you know, idealizing to a certain extent. There are also some wonderful letters um, that he writes to Ramon Paez, who is um, a Venezuelan uh, writer and painter himself. And Paya says, I, oh, everybody loves your palm trees, Mr. Church. And I desperately want some palm trees in my painting. And Church is uh, like, you know that they don't grow at this altitude, um, <laughs> you know, uh, where, where Cotopaxi is. But if, you know, I will do my best to, to accommodate your request or something. So, you know, it, it's people want these things where they loved his rainbows, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that he saw the rainbow that day when he saw that mountain, but you know he's so he's combining so that's a good question is it's um and people at the time that had to be explained to people mm. you know because they didn't quite get it because you know a lot because they hadn't traveled to these places themselves i think they were being a little they were you know they didn't know how to interpret this but in a lot of the um critics the the yardstick a lot of times was realism right like with mm -hmm. Gershot's paintings too like this doesn't look like a mountain the right mount type of mountain or something you know, they measured it by realism, but so Winthrop and others are trying to explain, no, 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 you know, church combined all these things and you're seeing the best, right? Church had to travel for six months and, um, you know, face all kinds of dangers just to see all these things, but he's combining in, the, in this one painting for you to enjoy. So yeah, it, that was kind of the, um, the logic of that type of uh, composition. Yeah. And I, I love, you know, kind of thinking about that and thinking about him in relationship to to a buyer, to a market, because I think it really contextualizes the artist in in an in a larger ecosystem and in one in which there is, you know, a, a business and a market and this kind of uh you know, popular popular culture, but also this uh, new emerging business opportunities. We had a comment come through from Lynn Lynn Valenci, um, not so much a question, but co a conjecture that maybe the early trip with Cyrus Field, who was by 1853 fascinated by developing the telegraph, um, Field would have been looking at South America and the majesty of Cotopaxi and the land of Ecuador, maybe as business opportunities for mining and maybe would have had influence on church in terms of making a living as an artist. So thinking about church also existing, not only in this ecosystem, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on on that as well in this emerging business business field and extractive businesses as well. Well, absolutely. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I mean, field was. Um... You know, he says he says himself that when he came back from South America, it was kind of an you know like a, a, a turning point in his own life, and that's when he turned more towards the transatlantic cable. But when they were traveling, I think his brother had actually set out to find these mining opportunities, the lost brother that was they were supposedly looking for, and um, you know, so so they are thinking about those things absolutely. But you know, to also keep in mind that Humboldt himself went to, to his training was in the school of mines mining and that he was supposed to also be looking for these kinds of opportunities for uh for people and and some of his writing addresses that and mm -hmm. not just humble but this church is part of this whole moment you know i talk uh when there are many many american travelers from the u.s um looking for opportunities in south america so they're and well, in Mexico, too. So so because remember, the Mexican U.S. Mexican War was just 1840 ended in 1846 ended in 1848. The United States acquires the California and the Southwest and a lot of these areas that had been Mexico uh, just previously. So um, th there is, again, this sense of uh, these lands are ours for the taking. You know, I mean, there we we don't necessarily think that everybody wanted to go all the way to the tip of Pat Patagonia in their conquest of, of for territory but but there was a pri proprietary attitude towards these places and that the these whatever mineral resources or anything else that they could find um you know could have been theirs for the taking and mm -hmm. you know and there was also the attitude not necessarily expressed by church himself but 
um, you know, that a lot that the people who lived there weren't really up to the task of um, of developing these things, right? That they needed uh, as a Yankee enterprise, and, and those that fra- kind of phrase appears in the travel literature. So, you know, these th- there was this idea that not only are all these riches there there for, for us to think about for developing, but these people can't do it themselves at all. I mean, that you know, that that was how kind of um, unfortunately one of the prejudices that that existed in the in a lot of the writing at the time. Yeah, this, I mean, this painting, we could talk about it forever. I mean, it's so so part and parcel (laughs) with this, this thinking about this 19th century worldview, thinking about some of these concepts and thinking about this rich historical context. I do want to just flag for folks that we're a few minutes after seven, um, but I do want to make sure that we just get to two kind of quick questions about the painting. Um, Katrina asked if the painting, if Heart of the Andes will be on loan from the Met for the new exhibit. And so I just want to clarify for folks that while the exhibit uh, will not include the painting, we will be having a lot of the ephemera and the various um, materials that church used to advertise the painting on view, as well as an immersive installation 2D, two and a half D video that I encourage everyone to come take a look at that takes you <laughs> into the uh, into the painting. So it's really a wonderful show and I, I encourage you to come check it out. Um, and then I just had one question about the, the provenance of the painting. So Blodgett purchases it, who donates it to the Met? It was late. Um, he let's see. So he dies in seventy six, and then uh, somebody else acquires it, and then yeah, and then it's given to the Met pretty early, pretty early on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Blodgett lives till seventy six. Um, Church uh, borrowed the painting again for sixty four, and then he borrowed it again. So uh, poor Blodgett didn't have didn't have that painting uh, as long as he might have hoped, but uh, but he was a, a very patient p- patron. <laughs> Uh, Lynn clarified that the the it was bought by Tony Stewart, the Gilded Age collector. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Sorry. Yes. That's yeah. Oh, that, wonderful. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> that that adds yeah you know, that adds to the richness of it because of course Stewart was the big uh, uh, department store magnate. <laughs> fascinating what a what a fascinating talk thank you so much Kathy this has been oh, such welcome, a wonderful way to kick off the show and for those of you I know there are some remaining questions in the Q&A um, we'll send some questions and answers via via our email and stay tuned for an email with some more resources and information about this wonderful rich content um, there will be more webinars to come about our spectacle show and about some of the topics that we covered tonight so please stay tuned thank, thank you, you. So good night yeah